Now we are. Okay. Audio is good. Okay. Um, thank you for the reminder. All right. So the first thing we want to do is to take a look at the architecture again. Uh, for this class, you know, we want to STF, we want to store the flag register to where register D is pointing to. That's what we want to do. Um, where D points to is not a problem, okay? Because, you know, we already have a path. Okay, if you track down the address bus, which is this one here, the address bus goes through this multiplexer and it goes into a D multiplexer that comes, that is connected to output one of the register bank. And you can select register D, or, you know, register three of the register bank to be output one. So that's not an issue. We know how to do this already. But the other issue is there's no connectivity whatsoever between the flags, the output of the flags register and the data bus. So last time we already talked about you know, how you know, we can fix this is to use, <coughs> go to gates and pick up a controlled buffer and then you just put a control buffer you know, between the output of this and the data bus. That is the architectural change that you need, which is not the difficult part. The difficult part, okay, so this is the easy part, okay, and the length is not matching, you know, because you need a merger to make the register 8 bit wide before you connect to, um, well, you can merge before or after the control buffer. It's just a matter of, you know, well, you know, at some point you have to turn the five bits into eight bits, okay? But the idea is just that, okay, you need a control buffer in between. The biggest question is what do we do with this control line here? In other words, when do we turn on this control buffer and when do we turn it off? Because most of the time you want to turn it off because you know, most of the time, except for one single instruction, which is the one that we're trying to implement, everybody should turn this thing off. Is that making any sense? Okay. So how do you get started with this you know, homework assignment? Okay. <clears throat> so one thing you can do, I'm going to, okay, let, let me use the uh, tablet here. Let's try. And I don't see it anywhere. Oh, okay. It's just being slow. Okay. There we go. Cool. Okay, so what we need to do is to find out what can interact with the data bus. So the data bus, okay, let me just get rid of this first because it's just you know, causing a lot of confusion but because of all the orange lines. Okay, so we kind of know what to do, okay, in, in terms of you know, adding up one control buffer, you know, where put to put it, you know, where, what is the input and what is the output of that control buffer. That's not the issue. The issue is how do we control that control buffer? When do we turn it on and when do we turn it off? So we basically have to make sure that every single existing instruction We'll turn it off, except for the instructions that we're going to add. Is that okay? So we want to take a look at all the existing instructions. We'll just kind of do a quick run through, okay? You know, and see, you know, what um, what potentially do we need to consider? Yep. For the assignment, if our logic is like more complex than it has to be, would that be points off? No, nope. mm -mm. you don't have to go for the most optimal solution. You just have to have one that is correct. Okay. So, oh, wrong place. We don't, I have nothing in my Gmail account because you know, they make us use the Exchange server instead of Gmail, even though Gmail is available. Okay, come on. Okay, so we go to the instruction set. So what I'm doing right, <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> hmm. So what I'm doing right now is to just take a look at all the existing instructions and just kind of go through the reasoning and go like, okay, 
is this going to be a concern? Is this going to be a concern? And so on. So we'll go through every single instruction um, on this list. And then we ask the question, you know, would this be a concern? In other words, you know, would the no op instruction in this case be a concern for us? Does the no op instruction make use of RAM? No, it doesn't turn on RAM select. Well, for anything that does not turn on RAM select, um, but does it, does it use the data bus? Because the data bus um, potentially can be used for other purposes. Okay, so let, let me show you what I mean by that. So this is one thing that you kind of have to be careful about because when you click on the, um, the, data, the data bus, which is this one here, you can see how it can potentially uh, use a register to update not RAM, but go through here and update the program counter. So that means, you know, hey, you have to be careful with this thing because it can potentially um, do things that use, oh, actually, that means you know, this particular line is not even needed because we could have gone through this line in order to update you know, the program counter from a register. Wait, how did it go to the program counter? Uh, it goes, okay, so the, the thick line at this point is the data bus, right? So the data bus goes into this particular multiplexer. Oh. This multiplexer goes into another multiplexer that goes into the program counter. So potentially, I can, in fact, you know, use just the data bus to update the program counter. But I have to make sure that nobody else is driving the data bus. Okay. So this is one potential thing you know, that can be dangerous. Is you, you cannot just look at instructions that do not make use of RAM. There can be other instructions that put something onto the data bus, even though it's not communicating with RAM. Okay. <clears throat> But because of the exam, you have a table already. So you kind of know, you know what instructions can potentially talk to the data bus. So when you highlight the data bus, which is this whole thing here, so now you start to identify you know, the components that, that can potentially drive or listen to the data bus. Okay, so I'm gonna make a list here. Um, let me see if I can do this. Put this on one side, and minimize this. Put this on the other side, and okay, I think we can do it like this. Oh, okay, I know what to do. We'll we'll switch. Make this on this side so I don't waste screen space, and then we we now have more space. Okay, so we're making a list of things that can potentially connect to the data bus. So we'll just say this is oh, uh, wrong color. Okay. So we are looking at data bus connected components. Okay. Uh, PC, the program counter can read. It can read the uh, from the data bus. So the so you can basically say pc.d which is the D port of the program counter can connect to the data bus. And that we know because of this part here. That connects to this, this connects to the data bus. Okay, so that's one. Then we look at other things. We can see that output one, or output zero, excuse me, output zero of the register bank can also be connected to the data bus. So on that side, we basically say out one of the register bank can potentially connect to it. And that is controlled by the register output zero DMUX. Okay, so we'll write down the signal name here. Register output zero DMUX. Okay. What else is connected to the data bus? A whole lot of stuff actually. You can see the, uh, the instruction register is also connected to the data bus. This is how we read instructions into the instruction register. So we say you know, the instruction register dot D, the D port of the instruction register, connects to the data bus. All right, let's see what else is connected to the data bus. Um, well, naturally the D port of RAM is connected. So RAM dot D 
is also connected. So I'm making an inventory of things that can connect to the data to the uh, to the database. And I think I made a mistake here. This is out zero and not out one that connects to the database. Out one connects to the address bus. Out zero connects to the database. Okay. So any instructions that can potentially read from or write to any one of these components, potentially you need to kind of like, okay, is this going to matter? Is this going to matter? Is this going to matter? Are we doing okay so far with this analysis? Okay. So when you go and try to um, test out the other instructions, you just got to make sure you got to check which ones or utilize. Right. So when you check, you can either check by uh, using the equation you know, that controls the control line of the control buffer, you can make that to exclude you know, things that can potentially be exercised in any one of these components, or you can just, just test it, right? You'll just go through every single one and make sure that you know, they do not interfere with STF, and STF does not interfere with those operations either. Okay. Okay. So now, so when you look at PC.D, okay, what will, um, what does this, when is PC.D actually going to be interpreted? Because you can put anything there. The program counter is not going to update unless PC enable is a one. Okay, so that means, you know, in this case, PC enable is the one thing that you need to check. And go like, okay, if PC enable is a one, we don't want to do anything with the flex register. We've got to make sure the flex register does not connect to the database. Okay. Um, output zero of register bank. Okay. When do? How do we know that that is driving the database? In other words, how do we know this connection is active? Well, one thing that we know is register output zero enable has to be a one. Okay. So now we write down here, okay, you cannot see because I'm wrapping around. So we have to look at regi register output zero enable, okay. Instruction register, which is just a register, has its own enable, okay. And how do we know RAM is paying attention to the database or not? RAM has got RAM select. Are we doing okay so far with this picture? Now, it's not like you know every single one of these has to be off in order to implement STF, because STF requires RAM select to be on. Otherwise, it makes no sense, right? You know, okay, here's the flag register. You know, make it output to the, to the data bus, but no one, including RAM, is paying attention. That doesn't help us, right? It doesn't do a single thing. Okay, so of these three, okay. We want, okay, I'm gonna use a different color here. We want this one to be a zero because we don't want the flag register to be used to update the program counter. That would not make sense at all. We want this to be a zero too because we don't want, oh, okay. Because we don't want, uh, to, we don't want a bus fight. We don't want the output zero of the register bank to fight with the flag register. Okay, so we want that to be off too. We definitely want this one to be a zero. We want uh, in the instruction register to be an enable to be a zero because we don't want to accidentally use the flag register content to update the instruction register. That would also be disastrous. Okay. So, but we do want this one to be a one. <coughs> okay, because you know, after all, you're trying to read something from you're trying to store something from RAM to RAM. Okay. So is this helping you kind of to come up with the equation that you need to specify, okay, when do we need that? Okay. Now the other thing that we also want to consider is what if we're adding some additional instruction that can potentially be messing around with the data bus? Okay. Then you have to figure out a way and go like, okay, this is a minimum to specify what we want to do but we also might want to specify something even more specific, just to say that, yep, okay, when this pattern happens, we are using the uh, flag register to, to update RAM. Okay. 
Okay, so how, how do you think we can do this? We have a lot of don't care flags, don't we? A, a lot of don't care bits. Let me think, let, let me explain. When register output zero enable, which is this pin here, this tunnel, is a zero, this entire demultiplexer is off. It doesn't send, you know, it doesn't do anything. Is that making any sense? But that also means this entire tunnel is useless because this tunnel, which is register output zero select, is two bit wide. It is used to specify one of the four registers to drive register output zero. Well, if output if register output zero enable is off, it doesn't really matter which bit pattern is specified in register output zero select. Does that make any sense? So that is giving you, you know, bit patterns that you can actually quote unquote hijack and say when register output zero enable is off and register output zero select is whatever, this tells me that we want to drive the flags register. We want the flags register to drive the database. Does that make any sense? Okay. So, <clears throat> when you look at this, the pattern as it is right now, okay, uh, just look at the red portion of this part. Are there current instructions that turns on RAM, okay, and I can even add a little bit more. So I can add one more item here. Because we also want to make sure that RAM load is a zero because it's a write operation, okay. So when you look at all of these combinations, do we have any existing instructions that will turn off program counter enable, turn off register output zero enable, turn off instruction register enable, turn on RAM select, and turn off RAM load? Are there any current instructions with this pattern already? Because if we do, then we have to kind of figure out, okay, how do we differentiate STF from that instruction. If not, then we can just go, hey, this is all we need at this point. What do you think? Now, which instructions are we talking about? Just because of the fact that we have RAM selecting a one and RAM low being a zero, means we are writing to RAM. How many current instructions can write to RAM? One. Is the ST instruction, right? With the ST instruction, does it have exactly this particular pattern of slices inside the microcode? Okay, what does the ST instruction do? It stores the content of a register to a location in RAM that is pointed to by another register. That's what it does. How does it get it done? Okay, two ways to figure that out. One way to figure it out is to look at the picture and you basically say, okay, we want one of these outputs to eventually connect to the data bus. We want another output to eventually connect to the address bus because that's the only way you can specify the content of a RAM location and say, store this, okay? Well, but doesn't that mean that you know this one has to connect to the data bus? which also means register output zero enable has to be a one for the store instruction. Okay, if that is the case, then we can use this here to be the differentiator and say, we are not doing the store instruction, we're doing the store flag instruction. Is that okay or not? Because we are looking for differences. We are looking for all the existing instructions and then we're looking at what we need to do for this particular instruction, and then we're looking at the minimum bit pattern of what we need to do for the STF instruction and say, does it overlap with any existing instructions? If the minimal list does not overlap, then we can just go for that. On the other hand, if it does, if it does overlap, then we need to use some additional bits to make a differentiation and say, oh, uh, we're not doing that, we're trying to do something else, but we need to make the differentiation. So 
So I think I have just answered your question. In fact, I've just done your homework assignment. <laughs> now it's just a figure out what kind of a gate you need to use. The, the, the output of the gate goes into the control pin of the control buffer, and uh, that should be it. And then the rest is just really testing it. <clears throat> is that OK? Good. Good. OK, most people are kind of nodding. OK. So if you're not quite connecting everything at this point, um, if you listen to the lecture again, you might be able to you know, make the connection because you know, it's, it's kind of all there. It's just, you know, <coughs> there, there might be missing some, I might be missing some steps when I explain it. Is that OK? OK. What if I want to extend the architecture again? Not as a part of your homework assignment, <laughs> but potentially as a, as, a, as a question for the final exam. What if I want to expand the architecture and say, I want to you know, store the program counter to what register D is pointing to, in addition to storing, being able to store the flag register? What do you think is going to happen? Now we have a little bit of a problem, don't we? Because in order to store the PC or the program counter to the location pointed to by RAM, we have exactly the same configurations. We are not using register of the zero to update that RAM location. We are using the program counter to update that location. So, so you cannot just use this minimal set anymore. Because this minimal set is now there's a collision between the STF instruction and the STPC instruction, store to program, store program counter instruction. Because they, they're going to exercise exactly the same control signal here. Program counter enable is a zero. Why? Because we are storing the program counter to a random location. We're not updating the program counter. Okay? Register output zero enable is a zero because we are not using register zero, re register of the zero to update the RAM location. We're using the program counter. The instruction uh, register enable is a zero because we're not trying to update the instruction register which connects to the data, data bus. RAM select is a one because we need to store the RAM. RAM needs to wake up and pay attention. RAM load is a zero to specify the right operation. So that is the STF or the store flags instruction it's going to have exactly the same you know, uh, big field specification as the store program counter instruction, which is going to be a problem because do you want to store the flags register or do you want to store the program counter? So we need some additional bits to differentiate between those two instructions, right? But I'm lazy. I don't want to extend the ROM width. I don't want to change the pin out because that's a, that's, that's a big hassle. So now what do we do? What spare bits do I have at this point that can help me differentiate and say, oh, okay, the program counter is the one that drives the data bus, not the flags register. So what extra bits do I, can I use at this point? There are some bits here that are definitely not useful, that there are currently, quote unquote, don't care. Can someone point out some kind of obvious bits that I can use to differentiate to differentiate between the STPC store program counter versus STF, which is store flex instructions? Program counter enable. Program counter enable. Um, but that is. Wait for the difference between the two. Yeah, between okay. So so these this particular pattern is common to STF and also STPC. Store program counter and store your flags will have exactly the same bit patterns. But if I need to differentiate be differentiate between, oh, I cannot, can you, you guys cannot see it. If I need to differentiate between store flags and store PC, I need some additional bits to differentiate. So. But we have some spare bits. We we got plenty. In fact, we got plenty of spare bits to do this. Yep. The program counter is usually 
go into the like the red address. So we would need to do the address through the um, the DMUX coming out of output one. Yep. The register bank, right? Yes. So we could, would that be the differentiating then? Because that would need to be driving the address. But they're they're both doing that. Well, well then would we? But when we're doing PC store, the PC counter the, would need to be going to the D port, not the A port, right? That is correct. So what could that be the differentiating thing? Oh, okay, I see. So you're basically looking at this bit here. Yeah, because if the program counters can't, it obviously wouldn't be driving the A port, so it would need to be, True. It would need to be registered bank output one, right? Yes. So could that be the differentiating factor, or the differentiating bits? Yep, that can be used in this case, correct. Okay, so that, that works. There are several bits that we can also use uh, because Okay, so let me slide, show this slide again. Because we are not using register output zero, register output zero select those two bits are now completely free to specify something else. And then we have four bit patterns there, so we can actually specify a few things if we needed to. So I'm just trying to guide you guys through you know, the, the whole thinking process of how to solve a problem you know, with certain constraints. Now if I say, you, okay, you guys can add you know, any arbitrary number of bits to the ROM and you can add additional control lines, it's not going to be as big of a problem because you can have a dedicated line just to say, Black's register, now you drive the database, right? That's an easy solution. But a lot of times, you know, the quote-unquote easy solution is not something that your boss wants to use because it involves, you know, relaying out the whole thing. It's not just adding one little component, but you have to add a new line, and then every the offset of every single line is going to change. It's, it's it's a much more costly solution. This one is inexpensive. Now, is it a hack? But it's, it's sort of a hack. Most processors that we use today contain you know, some kind of hack at some point. Okay, the most obvious one is the uh, x86 architecture. The longer the processor has been around, the more scar tissues it's going to have. <laughs> so the x86 processor, you know, especially in 64-bit, basically is all scar tissue. <laughs> you can't see the original thing anymore because it, it's all you know, stuff that is wrapping around the original design. Okay, any questions? The other class, by the way, is doing the opposite of the store instruction. They're doing the load instruction. So you guys are doing store flags. The other class is doing the load flags instruction. Load to like. Okay, so <coughs> is it just like loading into a register? Or? Um, no, loading directly back into the flags register. Oh, so, okay, gotcha. okay, so for this class, okay, so this is the uh, Monday Wednesday class. So for the Monday Wednesday class, we're doing the STF instruction. And then the pseudocode corresponding to the STF instruction is whatever D is pointing to gets the content of the flags register. This is what you guys are doing. The Tuesday Thursday class is doing the opposite, which is basically saying, OK, flags, update the flags register with whatever the register D is pointing to. So they're doing exactly the opposite, which turns out to be just a wee bit more complex <laughs> because the flex register has is directly connected to the ALU already. Okay, the output of the ALU goes into the input of the flex register. So the other class actually needed to introduce a multiplexer because now they need to select which way it's coming in. And then they also have to modify the enable of the flex register because now they have to say Oh, not only are we updating the flags register when we perform add, subtract, and whatnot, for this particular instruction, with these particular bit specification, you also have to update the flags register. So they, I think you guys have the slightly easier you know, problem to solve, and they have the slightly you know, more difficult problem to solve. But why are we doing this? Other than, yes, it's a homework assignment, and so on. It, I, 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 other than the fact that I really like grading homework assignments. We should know the processor well enough to make modifications. Okay, that's a, that's a good reason. Okay, and, and that would be, 
go ahead. Sorry. They, they, to suit what, what needs that might come up in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, and also, you know, if you are going into computer engineering and you are going to go design processors or design parts of a processor in the future, um, knowing how to do some stuff like this can be helpful. So just a little exposure. But from the perspective of the toy processor, this is a very important instruction. Or this pair of instructions is actually very important. Okay, why is that important? Because the flags can determine where we jump to. Yes, so, so that is true. The flags register you know, contains the individual bits where the conditional branch instructions can choose whether to branch or not. Okay, that's really useful. But we lose the flags register the moment we call a subroutine. Because who knows what a, what a subroutine is gonna do, right? The subroutine can do adds, can do subtract, can do compare. So by the time a subroutine returns back to the caller, the flags register is gone, just like registers A, B, and C. Is that making any sense? What if the flags register is important to me, the caller, and I have to make a function call at this point but later on, after the function returns, I want to retain the flags register. Right now, I have no way to do that. Well, no easy way to do it. I can kind of do it using branching. You can just go like, okay, you know, we can go here if the flag is already set. We can go here if the flag is already clear. And then use the location to differentiate, okay, was the zero flag cleared? Or was the zero flag you know, set earlier? But it would be much better if I have a mechanism that, so that I can save the flag register and then restore that later. Is that okay? So in the next slide, okay, well, I can, actually I can use the rest of this one here. I'm just gonna show you what I mean by that. Okay, so let's say we have a compare instruction. Compare, you know, I don't know, A, B, okay? Register A to register B. So that will change the flags register, which is the whole purpose of the compare instruction, is to change the individual bits of the flags register. Let's say for whatever dumb reason, okay, I'm gonna do a function call at this point. So before I do the function call, now with these two instructions, I can now do this. I can say decrement D STF. So these two instructions together is basically the same thing as pushing the flags register on the stack. Okay? Then I can perform a function call, you know, using those five lines of code, you know, to do the function call. When the function returns, I can now do a LDF increment D to restore or if you prefer pop the flags register. Now I have that flexibility. Before, there's no way I can actually retain the current value of the flag register. But now I can. Is that okay or not? There's one particular case I can actually say that, you know, okay, this may be one of the reasons. Because it is potentially possible that I have a conditional branch here, let's say a JCI to blah, 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 okay? But if I'm not branching, uh, I have something to do before I resume you know, and check for another flag from the same comparison. So that means you know after I restore the value of the flags register, now I can do a JLI to another place, but based on the result of the same compare. I don't have to compare again. I don't have to put the same content into register A and register B again. I'm just saying. Okay, let's look at the flags register again from that one single compare instruction, but this time I'm focusing on the L flag to go somewhere else. Is that okay? So there are reasons why this instruction is useful. Have I talked about interrupts in this particular class? I think I did. Interrupt. Interrupt. Interrupts. Hardware interrupts. Um, no? I don't know. So I don't know. Is that the keyboard? Yeah, the keyboard, the mouse, that sort of thing. Oh, I do remember talking about that. Okay, so let's talk about that again because this also relates to, it relates more to interrupts than it does to actual subroutines. Okay, but before we go there, we have to kind of use a particular term. A function call like this 
is what we call in software, you know, in software engineering, it's called a synchronous type of event. In other words, it is completely and 100% under the control of this particular program. Because, hey, after all, you are the one who specified where to make that call, okay? So you know exactly when it's gonna happen in terms of the sequence of, of this particular uh, program. Is that okay? Okay. So moving on to interrupts. Okay, so, so what do you guys remember about interrupts? <coughs> hmm? They occur from an external source. Okay, so interrupts represent events from the external world. Somebody push a button. Uh, the temperature exceeds a certain threshold. The motion sensor tripped. Okay, the door opened. Uh, somebody moved the mouse. So can the software anticipate when those events happen? Nope, it can happen at any time, okay? So that means when you have a program, okay? So let's say this is representing your code, okay? This is your program, which is not really using the mouse, it's not doing anything, but the rest of this particular processor really needs to monitor the doors, the windows, motion sensors, and whatnot. But your specific code is really doing some kind of background stuff like LCD display, okay? You just want to update the time, the date, you know, and stuff like that. You know, you're not the, you're not the part of the code that deals with your know, uh, intrusion and stuff like that. Is that okay? <clears throat> so I'm just gonna label here. This is your LCD control code, okay? It's just a scrolling message, you know, something that's really simple. At some point, somebody opened the door, okay? So let's just say that you know, your program is right here at this point when the door opened. Okay, so we have door opened this point. So when the door opened, typically we have a sensor of some kind, you know, usually a very simple sensor that just disconnects and it generates an interrupt. So the interrupt is a hardware feature that connects directly to the processor. It's basically saying, hey processor, something needs your attention. Okay? So the processor will now want to execute the interrupt surface routine, which is also software. It's you know, basically written the same way as all of the other programs that you have written here today, I mean in this class. So what this is going to do is it will trigger the processor to execute you know, what we call an interrupt surface routine, in short, ISR code. The ISR code will do something, okay? You know, it can potentially be turning on the siren, okay? Um, it can potentially be triggering another thread of the same program to send a message or packet, you know, through the network to, to some other node. It can, it has stuff to do, okay? So we'll just say that it has got stuff to do. When the ISR is all done, what do you think it should do? Exactly, it should go back to where it where it where the code di digressed. Okay, it has to go back to the digression point and continue execution, so that your code, which is the LCD control code, would continue to execute as if nothing happened. Okay, the key word here is as if nothing happened, okay? Because the ISR is made out of exactly the same kind of opcode as your code, so that means the ISR can contain opcodes like CMP, CPR, LD, ST, um, increment, decrement, blah, 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 okay? It can change registers. It can change the flag register as well, okay? So if we can change all of those things, how can we pretend that nothing happened? Store everything. Yep, store everything that you're gonna change in the ISR, and we store everything that you're changing in the ISR. So that means the entry point of the ISR needs to save everything first. 
everything everything so how do we save everything well we start with decrement D to allocate space on stack STD register C decrement D STD register B decrement D STD um, register A decrement D STF store the flag register now the ordering here is not really that important if you choose I want to store the, store, uh, store the flag register first fine okay it's just that when you restore everything you have to reverse the entire order okay so when the ISR is about to return here okay this is not going to be the right return point so when it returns it has to restore everything and what that's going to do in this case is it will start with the LDF increment D um, LDAD increment D and so on it's basically just the reverse of the save everything sequence except you know not only are we reversing the instructions the ordering of the instructions but the direction is also reversed if you if you're storing to begin with you're loading if you're decrementing to begin with, you're incrementing. But it's a mirror image otherwise. Is that okay? So the very last one of these instructions would basically look at the stack and say, hey, what if I just register D's pointing to and put it back into the PC, the program counter, so that you can continue execution over here. Which also means, in this case, not in the code, but the processor is responsible to save the return address. And that is why we need to connect the program counter directly to RAM, because the interrupt mechanism requires that particular mechanism. Is that okay? So at this point, the toy processor has no capability of handling interrupts because we are lacking the, um, the pathway between the flex register and RAM, but we're also lacking the pathway between the output of the program counter and RAM. We have the opposite. We can, we can load something from RAM directly into the program counter, but not the other way around. So that's why we need to extend the processor a little bit in order to prepare for the hardware interrupt feature. Yep. Do we need to store and reload the program counter if this were to be exactly picking up where it left off? Yes. Okay. So the very last operation here, if you look at the entire thing, uh, would be the instruction that we talked about in the uh, in the exam. Do you guys remember in the exam, you know, what was the what the instruction was? No. Nobody remember. Remember, that you have to implement two slices of instruction, and I gave you the pseudo C code. Yep. Yep. It's not exactly a uh, okay. So I, I, I can pull that up. Unconditional. Is it's an unconditional branch, but where are you branching to? D. What D is pointing to? Oh. It's it's jumping to the location pointed to by D. Okay. So I think I I think I recall enough. Okay. So the 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 opcode that you were dealing with in the exam has the pseudo C code looking like this. Okay, so let me switch back to black. <clears throat> it is PC equals to whatever D points to, and then D has to increment after that. Okay, does that look like, you know, what your, what the question is in the exam? Okay, and how does that fit into this picture? Now remember, in these two are impl this is one slice of the uh, microcode. This is the second slice of the microcode. Okay, but all slices of microcode, you cannot have interrupts happening between slices of microcode of the same opcode. So that means you know this particular. Um, it is as if this is uninterruptible. So that's why you know you can kind of reverse it. Well, this is not even reverse the order. This is the correct order to do things. But what is this going to do at the very end of the ISR? 
for any subroutine. What is the duty? What, what sequence of instructions does it replace? Go ahead. I don't know. Is it like a return? Like yep. It reminds you of the return address, and then you clean up the stack? Yep, exactly. So it replaces that sequence. In other words, these two will replace the sequence of the usual thing, which is LDB uh, indirect register D, um, increment D, and then JMPB. These three instructions, individual instructions, is replaced by this one single instruction. In other words, this single instruction is usually called return. That is needed for the interrupt mechanism because the interrupt mechanism also needs return as the very last operation so that it can return back to where the interrupt occurred. But then the processor, not a particular instruction, the processor itself, without executing a particular instruction, has to do two things. It has to save the program counter when the interrupt occurs on the stack. Then it has to know where to go to the ISR, the interrupt service route. Is that okay? So that mechanism is going to be internal to the processor itself. It can be implemented in microcode, but it's not going to be a software code. It's not going to be an instruction that you put here at this point. Why not? <clears throat> okay, let me repeat that question because you know, that, that's, it's a little bit confusing. We need a particular mechanism to do the protocol call, right? Okay, so whenever you need to go to the ISR, you need to save the current program counter on the stack so that, a, so that it, you leave, you're leaving behind a piece of breadcrumb so you can return back to this point. Then you have to do an unconditional branch to the location of the ISR, which can be fixed, okay? So we can, we can dedicate location 128 to be the ISR. It's okay, that, that's what you know, some processes do, is they, they pre-allocate a particular address for ISRs, okay? That's not a problem. So then we'll continue execution over here, which is all done in software. Okay, instructions. At the very end here, it will execute a return going back to here. But the, the part that goes to the ISR is not the result of executing an instruction that you specify. And the question is, why not? Because it could be anything? Exactly, because it can be anywhere, okay? Because, you know, in the entire execution of any code other than the ISR itself, at any point, this can happen. And you cannot just have a call you know, to the ISR interleaving with every single instruction because that basically boils down to polling again, which is what we're trying to avoid. So the processor needs kind of an extensive you know, uh, change in order to support um, in the interrupt mechanism. And yet it is a very crucial you know, feature um, that almost every single commercial processor has. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay. So the other class, uh, the Tuesday Thursday class, you know, got a uh, we got a we had a, a guest speaker yesterday uh, from AT and T, uh, and the guy is here to basically explain to us, you know, why we should not support uh, net neutrality and no, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> got you. <coughs> Now, he was here to talk about what AT&T is doing. Not regarding net neutrality, but he's talking about what AT&T is doing regarding the infrastructure and what type of jobs and uh, career is available here you know, from AT&T. Because most people think about AT&T as what? Other cell than phone, cable. cell phone, cable, okay. you know, just a typical telco, right? Department so choice. employment opportunities would include what? Okay, you might be driving that truck with a big old big ladder on it, you know, to do surfacing, right? You go to people's house, you fix up, you know, the network, you set up, you know, Wi-Fi network, you set up internet connection access, you lay out cable. Okay, you know, those are actually pretty high-paying jobs, right, by the way. The people who lay out the optical fiber cable, you know, those are actually pretty high-paying jobs because you know, a lot of training has to go into those jobs, and they're not they're not too bad. 
So I got these brosh uh, brochures from uh, AT&T yesterday. Uh, versatile module for virtual anything. So they are, okay, let me. <clears throat> so AT&T is into, the I into IoT. The IoT, the Internet of Things. So they are making these tiny little modules. Okay, you know, I can, I can pass this around if you want to. But they're passing these, they're, they're making manufacturing and also programming these tiny little modules. If I were to think about the real size, it's going to be about the size of, a, of an Arduino. But it is internet connected. It has got a, a, a TCP IP stack, most likely you know, version 6 already, you know, because you know, it doesn't make any sense to, con to continue with uh, IP ver version 4 if you're talking about the internet of things. Um, they are, uh, he's, the guy who made this talk is, is called, uh, his name is David Mack, okay? And he's saying that, you know, right now, okay, we have about 600 million devices on the net. 600 million. Which doesn't sound really a, a whole lot because the population of the United States is 300 something million already. So it's basically two IP addresses per person. It's like, okay, it's not. I mean, I got a tablet here, I got a phone here, I'm using a computer. So right now I have three IP addresses already. <coughs> but he said that by year 2025, there will be two billion devices on the net. Sounds about right. Sounds about right. So, so AT&T is now you know, getting into the Internet of Things, not from the consumer products perspective, but from the commercial perspective. So if you are a, let's say you are, okay, let's say you run an orchard, okay, like walnuts, okay, whatever, <laughs> okay, and you need to monitor you know, the moisture of the soil, okay, you need to monitor, um, you, you have a, uh, you want to set up um, a camera so you can actually look at you know things and so you don't have to go out there to see you know, what needs to be surfaced. Guess what? This is the answer. Okay? You you need you know to, to hook up your IP camera to the as an Internet of Things, okay? As one of the thing in the Internet of Things, right? So they're trying to get into that market. So that's one brochure. If you guys want to pass it around and just take a quick look, you know, feel free to do it. <coughs> The second brochure, you know, the title is AT&T Threat Intellect, Data-Driven Insight Analytics and Data Scientists to Detect and Respond to Threats. In other words, AT&T has their own cybersecurity team. That relates to what we did a few, like two weeks ago maybe? <coughs> I think it's about two weeks ago, maybe last week? Okay, I cannot remember. Last week is kind of strange because we got Thanksgiving and stuff. So, but anyway, I did show you guys how to hack the program, right? So AT&T is kind of is getting into that too, which makes a lot of sense because the moment you try to push out more things onto the Internet of Things, guess what? Hackers have more targets. Now I have to confess, you know, I'm contributing to this problem <coughs> because I, uh, I I just bought a range, okay, you know, like a cooktop. And it's internet connected. You go like, why would a stove, okay, be internet connected? Well, that thing can hook up to the internet, and if I install an app on my phone to hook up to the same cloud point, you know, to, you know, basically the the server, okay, um, when my oven gets to a certain temperature, it can notify me and go like, your oven is now ready for your cookies. So you can preheat them before you get home. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like if you get a yes. Papa Murphy's and freeze it on the way home. That's yeah. what I want to make by the board. Yep. So, okay, so my, my open, my, my range is going to be connected to the internet. But once it is hacked, guess what? It is inside of Wi Fi, right? It's inside my Wi Fi network. So people don't even need to crack my Wi Fi password because if they crack one of the devices in my internal network, in my LAN, it becomes pretty easy to hack into the other things on my land. And yep. they could burn your cookies remote. Yeah, they, they can, can burn your yeah. cookies. Yeah. Actually, no, yeah, they can burn your house down, actually. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be evil. Yeah. 
Yeah. Your other room that's that's actually it's the fact. Yeah, that's the nature. So what I'm asking is, three o'clock curfew limits. Um, the amount of data that the oven can transmit. Because what, why isn't it just talking about anything else other than you know the temperature is at this? Well, it's very simple. I mean, who, but who is going to limit that? Who, who is going to say, okay, this is an open, this is a range. It, it really should not be transmitting social security numbers. But how do you know it's transmitting, you know, social security right. numbers? That's, that's if it's going through SSL, you know, then it's, like, well, it's encrypted. So the idea is it's an end-to-end -end encryption, and nobody can actually see the, the actual traffic itself. Oh, you're right. Yeah, I guess the social security <coughs> number is you know, very small amount. So I'll talk about, like, transmitting, like, you know, large, a cache of gigabytes you have on your, on your PC. Exactly. That might connect okay. that. Um, but it doesn't need to do that because, you know, the, the open only needs to be a launch point to attack my other computers. So it can, you can send a very sure. small payload to one of my PCs, hack the PC, oh. then the PC itself sure. is going to talk to the evil mothership and send all my you know, tax returns to the mothership, right? Okay. All, all the, the each cookies up master. Yeah. So the third one says right here, it says AT&T Security Con uh, Consulting. So, you know, so this means, you know. I've been I don't want to walk across the class. Oh. <laughs> okay, so the third one says um, AT&T Security Consulting. In other words, they are offering service to mom and pop shops, you know, where they have to install computers, hook it up to the internet. They can basically, okay, I'll read the first few paragraphs. Vulnerability scanning, the first step in proactively defending against security breaches. So whether a business has 20 or 20,000 employees, AT&T offers customer vulnerability scanning services, a fundamental necessity to help drive, help drive risk from, or from the organization. Okay, so you can read this too. But all I'm doing is, not, I'm not promoting AT&T. Okay, I don't get any kickback or anything from AT&T. Like <laughs> I don't even use AT&T. I use you know, Shore West or Consolidated Communications at home. My cell phone is T-Mobile. Okay, I, I have disconnected from PepBell a long, long time ago. But what I'm saying here is, if AT&T is doing this, other people are doing the same thing. There's a market for this type of jobs. Okay. The next one is about analytics. Okay. In other words, you collect all the data. Okay. Let's say you run a supermarket. Okay. You collect all the data. You know, everybody who wants to apply a discount has to enter the new special ID. Right. So you can now track people and say, Oh, I see that you buy avocados every single morning, Monday. Okay, and you always buy, you know, red red uh, wine on Fridays, okay, and so on and so forth. So you have all this data coming in, but how do you make use of that data? It's called analytics, right? You know, how do you use that data to drive you and go like, okay, how much should I stock this kind of stuff? How much should I stock that kind of stuff? Where do I put those things, depending on the day of the week, and so on and so forth. So that's all analytics, and this one says, you know, data patterns. Empowering marketers or marketeers with powerful data and actionable insights to optimize your business. Okay, so I'm going to pass this one around. So once again, I'm not promoting at and I'm just trying to tell you guys what at and is doing because if they are doing it, they're going to do it. They, they must be doing it for a reason. Okay? No, that they released it, that they're doing it. Right. I assume they were probably working on this without, you know, not publicly, right? <coughs> it is public. Oh, it's public now, but there was a period of time when they were working on it that wasn't public, right? That's so, true. So that, that means that other companies do that. You know, but there's like privately. Right. But that means yeah. there's a market out there for people with this kind of expertise. Okay. Now the guy also kind of mentioned, you know, on his own, not as an AT and T employee, you know, he also mentioned AI, artificial intelligence. So maybe AT&T AT is not quite there yet, but if you think about you know, big data, which means you're collecting all the data and you're looking for patterns, right? AI can do that, okay? You can train an AI to find patterns. 
And you can also train AIs to optimize for certain things. So when you plug in that AI you know, component into this whole equation, then you get something that's really kind of interesting and kind of unpredictable at the same time. The last one is a retail analytic solution for brick and mortar stores. Okay. So right here it says, you know, building on the industry leading accuracy of the retail next TN trademark platform, AT&T venue and analytic combines multiple sources of data to offer retailer in an all-in-one analytics platform. This solution makes it easy for you, meaning you're a you know, brick and mortar company, to collect, analyze, and visualize data about store operations, security, and cons consumer engagement. So they are not a telco. They're not just a telco anymore. And there's a reason why they're not a telco anymore, just a telco. Why do you think AT&T is branching out to do all of these things that we think? Really, AT&T does that too? Multiple reasons. <coughs> I mean, if look at a pure marketing standpoint, if you pull your eggs in a telco basket, mm -hmm. you know, there's a chance you might go under and stuff. So you might want to branch out anyways to where it was lucrative and it's still so lucrative. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Sorry. I said profit. It's profit, okay, very good, because AT&T is, after all, a public traded company, right? So every quarter they have to report earnings. And they have the right infrastructure to push these additional services, because they're already handling the telco part, right? So the guy who goes in to maintain the telco equipment can now say, oh, I see that you are you know, a retail shop, you know, doing da 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 da, Okay, um, we can help you, you know, optimize your business. By the way, you know, we can help you collect the data and analyze the data and make, you know, smart decisions, you know, for in terms of business. Would you be interested? <clears throat> so that's, you know, kind of why they're, this is kind of natural for at and to branch out into. <clears throat> now, okay, getting back to net neutrality, a student, a student in the, Tuesday, Thursday class, actually asked the guy. You know, he raised his hand, you know, the guy said, okay, what's your question? And he asked, so what, what do you think is the position of AT&T on net neutrality? <laughs> well, they want more money, but the guy made an argument of, you know, um, so you know, they have to prioritize traffic, okay? Because if you're sending an email, your SMTP packet can take a little bit longer to get to the destination. Okay. On the other hand, if you are trying to make a VOIP you know, call, voice over IP call to somebody, a 100 millisecond delay is really kind of noticeable because you will actually start to notice the chattering of the voice because it's not streaming correctly. So the guy is basically saying, okay, we need to prioritize traffic anyway because you know, there's traffic that can wait a little bit, it's not a big deal, and then there's traffic that has to go through kind of in real time. There's a minimal delay that you have to ensure, right? So, so that's why you know we kind of need to, you know, kind of do this net neutrality thing to make sure that there are fast lanes for real time traffic, and then slower lanes for not so real time traffic. So after the class, one of the other students, and also the same student who asked that question, basically said, "But you only need to do something like this when your bandwidth is insufficient." Because if your bandwidth is sufficient to begin with, then there's no need to prioritize like that. <clears throat> Isn't that also the core issue in that charging this will fix areas? It will make providers want to go out to make internet to areas that are don't have good internet, like you know, um, somewhere in the country or somewhere in the mid, Midwest, or whatever, where the internet is not the best. Mm. I do not know. I heard, I heard that was like one of the, because that's one of the problems that um, there are some a lot of areas in the U.S. that while well, have internet, don't have like good internet. Um, so, you know, doing this, um, charging for it, priority would actually encourage the virus to go out there to, you know, mm -hmm. build more internet and stuff like that. So, removing or saying, getting rid of, uh, go ahead. I could just do what they're saying. Oh, well, that's what they're saying. I, I, that's what all the huge major companies have come out and said like how they're not going to change the way they do things, but at the same time, they're all spending millions of dollars to lobby to kill that neutrality. So they obviously yep. are going to change something mm -hmm. if it's, once this passes. I think it's going to pass wrong and screwed. Well, they compare um, internet access or internet uh, 
bandwidth with highway traffic capacity. Because you know, the, they're comparing you know, the, the paid or more expensive channels as HOVs, HOV lanes on the highway. Now we don't really experience that too much around here. I think there might be one or two places where there are, H there are HOV you know, lanes. But in the Bay Area, it's really kind of prominent. You know, there are HOV lanes you know, wherever there's major traffic, there are like one or two lanes where like carpool lanes would be a better comparison, right? Yeah, carpool lanes, but HOV means you know you, you don't have to have that many people in a car if you pay for your HOV permission, right? You know, because they use the same fast track, you know, uh, transponder, you know, at the entrance. So if you pay for that, they identify that yes, you know, you, this car has already paid for HOV access, then you can be one single person driving the Tesla. <coughs> and you're just zipping through, you know, the HOV lane when everybody else is stuck in traffic. Yep. So that sounds cool, like, you know, like pay for like more prioritization and stuff, but the, but what they're going to do is now they're going to do that and then they're going to put speed bumps in the rest of the lanes. So yes. you have to do that instead of just giving someone the option for the HOV lane. Right. But but the, compar but the comparison is, is a little bit invalid in a certain point. Because when you look at highways, okay, and you say, okay, you know, the Bay Area is really congested, you know, we need more lanes. Can we easily expand the highway to include more lanes? No. So a six lane highway, I, we don't make it like a, at least you know, 10 lane. Can you extend the width of a highway easily and say, okay, we'll make this a 10 lane highway well, we all the way the from San Francisco to San, to San Jose? We can't on the bridge. Highway no, but the internet, you can't. Exactly, <laughs> with, with physical stuff, you cannot. But with the internet, it is almost happening naturally. Yeah. I was going to say, like with, with the cars, you know, it might be able to just like have less people on the road, essentially, like more carpools and stuff like that, reward carpools. Yep. Um, so that whole argument of you know we have only so much bandwidth, and we have to let the real time band, you know, real time communication to go first, is not going to fly. It doesn't make sense logically. Mm. Because if that is the case, if your if your bandwidth is limited to the point. When you have to prioritize, and let's say, okay, this is voice, this is video, they have to go through first. Oh, this is really slow traffic. You know, just web browsing will 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 leave will use will let these use the leftover bandwidth. Then these will never get done. As more people get onto voice or video and stuff like that, your internet browsing experience will will come to a grinding halt because that's low priority traffic, and it's not going to get through until. All of the high priority traffic is cleared. Unless you, unless you uh, subscribe to the package that includes the website you're trying to visit. Yep, exactly. So that basically gives more control to the providers and also the internet service providers to say, okay, if you want your Hulu or Netflix not to be, you know, chattering or you're know, buffering all the day, all the time, pay more. We have different levels of membership. And it's not just that, it would make the, it would make um, censoring and, what's the word, manipulation of information right. insanely easier I, for Okay, I need to know companies. about that part. Um, you know, what, what is neutral, uh, net neutrality currently doing to curb that? Well, to I mean, curb censoring? It's just like anyone who has a website can post what they want, but even on like social networks that are like hashtagging net neutrality. Mm -hmm. The social like Facebook and like uh, Instagram and like Tumblr have been, are owned by other companies that mm -hmm. partially are held by these major telecommunications companies like Verizon, at and I don't remember the third big one. But um, they're removing net neutrality hashtags. Mm -hmm. They're like actively suppressing the spreading of awareness to people. Like um, last night on Tumblr, you're, they were tracking that net neutrality hashtag mm -hmm. and people who are posting stuff to the hashtag the hashtag is being removed by tumblr who's owned by verizon uh, so they're they're suppressing the, the spreading of information like the spreading of awareness of it so they are in order to do what they need to do they are now doing what they say they would not do exactly by, yeah <laughs> that exactly. sounds like free speech that's going to not go well with law yeah know. right and you think the authoritarian people are all about free speech when it like applies to their Did you hear about the that credit thing that's going on in China, where you have to like, um, you have like a like a not a credit score, like a person score or whatever, 
um, based on the on the credit you have and your history, essentially criminal history, and especially the people who you are friends with. Mm -hmm. And based on who you are friends with, um, what's your score, and then the higher score you have is better. It's kind of like a score, but essentially it's free. You would like essentially. Okay. You know what I'm saying? I have to say that's pretty much what the culture has been doing for thousands of years. It is it is always who you know that really matters in China. Now it's now now, now it's electronic. Now it's tracked by websites, right? You know, so it's tracked by websites. But the question is, do we want that to be here? You know. Yeah, that's that's the question. Because whoever whoever's paying Congress. Anyway. Can we riot? Uh, we're gonna. Yeah, I know we are. <laughs> oh, Some, okay. Something's burning down. Okay, so I uh, think I there are that. ways to, <laughs> there are ways that you can voice your opinion on uh, net neutrality. Mm -hmm. So have you guys Wait. done any of that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Alaska, okay. There's a number you can text. You can go like this. There's a, I don't have it. There's a website that you can give them. Go ahead and see yourself. And they do all the heavy, they do all the calling and everything for you. Like, so you don't have to call anybody. I think it is the one that, Oh, oh, that's discouraging. <laughs> the first link is like, nope, you you are going to be ignored. The second link, you will be ignored. Yeah. The chairman's already Ajipai has already said that unless you present new information, they're not mm -hmm. considering it. So if they have a thousand people make the same argument, mm -hmm. that's one comment. So <laughs> they don't consider it important. Yep. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, this is kind of where things are going, not only with the FCC, but also with uh, the FDA, you know, the federal, uh, the drug, um, drug and drug communication. Yeah, FDA is also in charge of nutritional stuff and whatnot. Okay, you know, your food stuff, right? So who is in charge of the FDA, which is supposed to overlook, you know, nutritional values, you know, and, and monitor and regulate food industry? I don't see what the problem is. Okay, the FDA is pretty much owned by lawyers who used to work for all the meat, corn, and processed food industry. And, and pharmaceutical companies. And pharmaceutical so companies. The very the same organizations that they are, the, the FDA is supposed to so regulate. Yeah. Their lawyers are running the Tell organization. Me conflict of interest. Yep. So that's one. And then there's EPA, the oh. Environmental Protection Agency. Who's running the EPA? I mean, they stopped funding them. Oil. Oh. <laughs> There's Oil no money going to the EPA anymore. Oil companies and like, yeah. Like, uh, like lumber companies, people they're supposed to be regulating as well. Yep. But the lumber companies are relatively small oh, compared yeah, to relatively the oil companies. Oil, absolutely. Yep. But they're still messing stuff up. Yep. And then now the FCC, you know, is being basically controlled by the telcos. So, you know, it's it's a very kind of, it's it's over the, it's, if you look at all the major agencies who has to do regulations, they are doing the same thing. Yeah. Yep. Moral of the story, carrying this point plus, we lose. <laughs> Just be a peon. <laughs> okay, so anyway, um, you know, I think this is a good point to stop the lecture. The yes, it is killed. recorded. Sorry? Now that Pope has been killed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you will find the second half of this lecture disappearing, you know, mysteriously <laughs> from YouTube, right? <laughs> And it's, and it's done by AI. And the thing is, it's going to be done by AI. The AI is actually transcribing. And then they, they figure out that I'm talking about net neutrality. And then they figure out my position you know, on net neutrality and go like, I think this part of the video can be neutered. <laughs> <laughs> that would just destroy your whole no, just don't, just don't hashtag it net neutrality. You know, YouTube actually has been like shutting down the accounts for random reasons. Random? Yeah, yeah, random. Yeah.